quick, I just want to introduce our next speaker. I assume Stephanie can hear me. Hi, Stephanie. Um, <laughs> Stephanie Smith is a consumer food space, uh, safety specialist and faculty at Washington State University. Uh, I reached out to her, I believe, in March because we were starting to have this conversation around some unknowns in the food safety side of maple syrup. Uh, and then we had a conversation, and I think that we either me or Kent or someone else has been bugging her just about every day since, uh, and then asked her to present here on this topic. So we're really excited to have her. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here due to a family emergency. She was planning on being here, but still very thankful for her being able to participate remotely. Uh, Stephanie, I think you can take it away. I want to put the speaker back real quick. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm getting some feedback on this. Um, maybe I should turn my speakers down on my end. Okay. Um, so I first of all, I want to thank you so much for having me. I'm really sorry I could not be there. Um, I really wanted to be there. And, but I'm happy I can still present today and I can share with you some of my knowledge um, about food safety and how that can impact um, maple syrup processing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, pathogens that can be associated possibly with maple syrup and then we'll talk about how to control those pathogens with the major um, can um, players are going to be for controlling the pathogens. I'm going to briefly talk about some regulations that impact maple syrup processing, um, especially with regard to food safety, and then give you a list of some resources that you might want to, you know, take a look at, especially if you're going to, you know, pursue, you know, processing and selling to consumers. There are a lot of different pathogens that can um, cause disease or microorganisms that can, you know, cause spoilage issues as well, but can also cause foodborne disease. Bacteria are the major players that we're generally looking at, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that is. Um, viruses can also potentially get into food products as well as parasites and um, fungi, but a lot of times with the fungi, they cause more spoilage issues. So these include things like yeast and molds, but I'm gonna focus a lot on bacteria because um, they can you know, replicate quickly in a food product and, and cause a lot of issues, including illnesses. And um, so syrup can become contaminated in a lot of different ways. And so one of those, of course, are, you know, through people that are handling the syrup. And, you know, maybe if somebody is sick with uh, a, you know, some sort of bacteria or virus, it can actually get into the syrup. And then if it's a bacterium, the organism can actually start growing and multiplying. Um, soil can be another issue. So if you have contaminated soil or yeah, basically contaminated soil that's blowing in, you know, onto the equipment or, you know, on um, onto the tree where you're tapping it, then pathogens can get into the syrup that way, as well as equipment and then also, you know, animals. So in this, you know, for example, in this picture, there's a, a bird on um, here, you know, so of course birds are associated with trees. And so that's a really good way to, you know, get pathogens into the maple syrup. So focusing more on bacteria, since that's the one we're concerned about the most, so bacteria need what we refer to as fat tom. So it's an easy acronym to remember. So basically food, they like our food. Um, it provides them with a lot of nutrients that they need to grow and um, reproduce. And then of course, acidity plays a factor. So, you know, maple syrup generally, you know, has a pH 
between seven and eight. So, you know, microorganisms love that pH. They can grow very easily at a pH of 4.6 to eight, and a lot of them can even grow at a lower pH. So that, you know, having maple syrup that has an, uh, a pH value of seven to eight makes it, you know, great for bacteria. That's their favorite. Um, Bacteria can reproduce quite rapidly in a food. So some grow and divide approximately every 20 minutes, and um, some maybe even a little faster than that. And they also really like, you know, the the same temperatures that are, you know, help with, well, in food production or, you know, with food being stored, for example. So definitely between 41 degrees and 135 degrees, they um, microorganisms can grow, bacteria can grow, and then especially at room temperature up to, you know, around, uh, you know, 110, 120 degrees, they'll grow the fastest. Oxygen plays a role. Some bacteria, as we'll see in a moment, need oxygen, but some don't. Some don't care if it's present or not. They can grow regardless. And then we're going to talk a lot more about moisture. So water activity is um, basically describes the amount of water that's available for microorganisms to grow and reproduce. You know, so that's a, a simplified um, explanation of water activity, but basically it's the amount of water that's available for them. And bacteria can multiply and grow when the water activity is above 0 0.86. So pure water, um, water activity is on a scale of 0 to 1, and pure water has a water activity of 1. And um, so, you know, as we reduce the amount of water in the product, that water activity starts to drop, as, especially if the water is bound up by sugars, for example, such as in maple syrup. And then, um, you know, the water, the water activity will start to become decreased in a food product. But as long as that water activity is above 0 0.86, then microorganisms will grow. And it's quite surprising because there's a lot of foods that you think are pretty dry that actually have water activity above this value. So we'll talk more about this um, as I get through the rest of the presentation on food safety um, and on why these aspects are gonna be so important. Okay, so basically, you know, with, um, with bacteria, I mean, they're in the environment, they like our food, they can grow really quickly They in our food products, right? And then once they get into the food product, it becomes really hard to destroy some of them. And so we'll talk more about how we can manage that in maple syrup. So first I'm gonna talk about some of these pathogens a little bit more. So I've told you, you know, a little bit about their favorite growth temperatures. I've told you about water activity, about pH um, that'll allow these microorganisms to grow. So I'm just gonna give you some examples of this. So my first example is salmonella. And we see salmonella basically coming from birds, but other human or humans and other animals can carry salmonella as well. And salmonella really likes those growth temperatures of 41 degrees through 115 degrees Fahrenheit. They grow at a water activity at 0 0.94 and at a pretty broad pH range, um, 3.7 to 9.5. And they can grow with or without oxygen. So if a bird is you know, up in a tree and you know, basically it defecates, you know, onto, you know, a um, onto a tap, or you know, droppings fall in. If you're collecting using buckets instead of lines, then you know, if it defecates and it falls into a bucket, then it can contaminate your maple syrup, and it may, and that fecal contamination may possibly contain salmonella. Shea toxin um, producing E. coli is probably a little less of a concern. Um, generally, it's transmitted by ruminants. 
here is where you're going to have more issues possibly if there's other land activities that are occurring where you're going to be collecting your syrup near the trees so you know basically if there's blowing contaminated soil that can be an issue we've seen um, contamination of trees more with produce in with um growing produce so especially tree fruit where there's potentially been, well where there's been a cattle lot you know near where the orchard is and um, they have a lot of manure piled up and then that gets blown into an orchard uh, so that's definitely a, you know a possibility potentially with the um with maple syrup processing as well that it could blow onto the trees especially if the stand is is near a farm where there could be animals or they're you know applying manure for example so sugar toxin producing e coli has a growth temperature same around 44 to 121 degrees fahrenheit It'll grow in foods with a water activity around 0 0.95, a pretty wide pH range. So of course, maple syrup within that maple syrup pH range and will grow with or without oxygen. Listeria monocytogenes is another um, organism that is in the environment. So it can be associated with soil, water and plants. Listeria is really concerning because it has a mortality rate of 20 to 30 percent if somebody becomes um, sick with it. So that's definitely a concern. We generally see this organism becoming a problem inside processing facilities. And I'll talk a little more about what you can do in facilities to just, you know, help keep this organism out um, there. But you know, you can see it has a pretty wide um, growth temperature range. The one thing that's special to note about this organism is it'll grow at 31 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the temperature of, you know, normal refrigerators, right? Um, actually, that's a little below freezing. So um, there's, you know, that's definitely a concern that can grow even under refrigeration. The water um, activity that allow for growth of this organism is 0 0.92. And you can see it has a pretty broad pH range as well. And the last one I'm going to talk about here um, is Clostridium botulinum. And this organism is the one that produces the botulinum toxin. So it'll cause you know, botulism disease. If somebody becomes um, ill from the toxin or comes in contact with the toxin, the mortality rate's about 5 to 10 percent. But even if the person does not die, it can cause really severe, you know, disease um, and lifelong disease. So you can have a lot of nerve damage, you know, paralysis, those sorts of things that are just, you know, really horrible. This organism is an environmental organism. It's commonly found in soil. So again, you know, that blowing soil can be um, an issue and, you know, surfaces out in forests, for example, can be an issue. And um, the other thing is that it'll grow really well around 38 degrees to 113 degree range. And then it in a water activity is 0 0.93. And, you know, maple syrup provides a proper pH for its growth as well. The one thing that's really important to note about this organism is that it grows without oxygen. So when you get, um, for example, syrup in a sealed container, this organism, if it's present, can potentially start growing because there's not going to be oxygen in that container. And um, so you, you know, sealed it off and without the oxygen there, this organism's happy and it starts growing. The other thing that's really important to know is that this microorganism produces spores. So spores, you know, I always think of them as like plant seed. You know, they, they just stay dormant. They kind of hang around and then as soon as they get the right conditions. So for bacteria, that's that fat tom acronym, right? So as soon as they, um, you know, get those conditions are all in place for them, they're happy, they germinate, they start growing. Um, so 
the, the spores are also heat resistant. They're extremely heat resistant. Um, and so this is really a challenge because you can't kill them during normal processes. And so I'll, I'll talk about that a little more in just a moment. But definitely keep that in mind with this, with this particular organism. Okay, um, so the fungi, um, especially, you know, like molds and yeast, a lot of these will grow under refrigeration. Um, and they also, um, they do like to grow when there's oxygen present. The one thing I really wanted to note about these, um, even though that's not our primary focus, is that they grow at a much lower water activity. So even, um, you know, at 0 0.75. So when you think about your jams and jellies, for example, um, and also, you know, maple syrup, a lot of that water is unavailable. It has a pretty low water activity. But, you know, if you open up, um, you know, say you have syrup in your refrigerator, you have jam and jelly uh, in your refrigerator, it's been there a little while, you keep opening the container, um, you take out some, you reclose the container, well, those molds are in the air and they can fall, of course, inside the container and then they start growing. Right? And we've all seen it. And then, you know, on top of it, they we know that they grow in the refrigerator because all of a sudden you open up that that um, that jam after it's been in there, you know, for a little while in your refrigerator, you open it up and there's, you know, mold growing. So that's a concern that definitely still applies to you know, maple syrup as well. And then molds and um, a lot of yeast also grow over a, a pretty wide pH range, so a pH of about two to nine. So we generally look at um, molds and, um, and yeast as more spoilage issues, causing quality issues with a syrup, but a lot of these can also cause toxins and, or cause allergic reaction so it's a little more than just you know a, a quality issue if well especially if somebody ends up having an allergic reaction or it produces a toxin okay so we want to be able to control these microorganisms right especially in you know the maple syrup it's so valuable and delicious <laughs> i might add um so we want to be able to control these organisms so that we can make sure that this syrup is safe and that we don't have quality issues that we don't cause foodborne illness so i'm going to talk about how to do that um i stole this year from the food um safety um, preventive controls alliance but on um, you know you, there's three aspects here right so the first thing is you want to prevent contamination from occurring in the first place and then anything that might be in the syrup already you want to kill it so so that's going to be your second way to control the organisms is kill what whatever is in there and then some organisms are gonna be harder to kill. And for those, we want to control the growth of those organisms. So I'm gonna start off and talk to you a little more about preventing contamination to begin with. So the first thing you wanna do is really make sure you're keeping things covered um, and keep, you try to limit the ability of you know, contaminants to fall into the syrup. So the more you can enclose a system, prevent contamination, the better it's going to be. People that are sick, that are that normally are around the syrup or handling the syrup, they should not be, be doing that if they're sick. So they should stay home. You know, it's always our general advice with any type of, you know, food processing is if a worker or, you know, um, an owner, is ill they should not be handling food that day and then definitely keep things clean so keep you know clothing clean gloves clean you know you don't want to come in with a lot of soil and and debris for instance on your clothes when you're processing um, the syrups so you want to make sure you're keeping things clean and 
you know, uh, and then with your facilities, keeping those clean as well. So, you know, making sure that you don't have pests coming in in the area where you're going to be processing the syrup. You know, I know that there's, um, you know, that some processing might take place in an outdoor environment, but when that process is being brought back in, um, you want to make sure that things are kept very clean and that pests aren't getting into the facility um, where you're processing it. You don't want animals in there, so definitely, you know, not your, you don't want your pets, um, or, you know, around where the syrup is, where you're tapping the syrup or the syrup is, um, or where you're processing it. You don't want to have a lot of standing water and condensate. So this gets back to um, what I was talking about with um, water, right? So, and that moisture that microorganisms love. So, you know, try to keep that to a minimum as well because, you know, standing water condensate um, can allow for microbial growth. And once you have a lot of growth, especially when you start getting into like bottling the syrup, for example, if you have standing water around, you can get a lot of microbial growth and then that can, you know, get, end up contaminating the product. So it's really surprising how microorganisms can go from you know, water on the floor onto or get your equipment and, you know, into your your bottles, those sorts of things. So you want to make sure that, that that's being avoided. Um, definitely, you know, make sure that any trash is, is taken out regularly. Again, you don't want want pests, you know, getting into the facility um, where you're doing your bottling. And then also, you know, make sure that your equipment um, can be easily cleaned and sanitized. And I'll, I'll talk more about clean and sanitizing in a minute, but just make sure that you're regularly cleaning and sanitizing everything. Um, so even if there's surfaces that maybe the syrup is not in direct contact with, you still, you know, like, um, like countertops, for example, um, you still want to be making sure that you clean and sanitize that. And then also um, definitely anything that's going to be coming into contact with the surface should be clean and sanitized regularly. So keeping things clean is important. So you really should have a cleaning and sanitation program if you're going to be um, processing syrup. And so definitely paying attention to the equipment and facilities. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like and how to do that. So but before I do that, I want to state that cleaning and sanitizing are definitely two different processes. So with a cleaning, you're actually doing the physical removal of dirt and soil from surfaces and, um, you know, just, just making sure you get all that off of there ahead of time. Um, so you're going to use, you know, detergents and, you know, water to rinse off detergents and just, you know, making sure everything's wiped down. With sanitizing, you're actually treated, treating a clean surface with a sanitizer so that you can um, remove um, microorganisms from that surface. So you're, you're trying to, you know, completely eliminate them or at least reduce the number of those microorganisms on the surface. If you're gonna use, um, if you're using sanitizers, you, you need to make sure that they are approved for use on a food contact surface. And so, you know, the label should you know, explicitly state that it is okay to use on a food contact surface and it'll tell you how to actually use that sanitizing agent. Same with the detergents, you wanna make sure that they're approved for use on a food contact surface. The other thing to note about sanitizers is that a lot of the sanitizers, if you don't do that cleaning stuff, the sanitizer is not going to work. So these sanitizers can get bound up by organic matter. So you know, your your soil, dirt, um, those sorts of things. And so then it becomes completely ineffective at sanitizing. So you want to make sure you do that cleaning step first. So this is basically what, you know, cleaning and sanitizing should look like, is you're going to remove that dirt and debris from the food contact surface. 
and then you're going to scrub that surface, um, you know, apply your detergent to that surface, and then rinse those, that detergent off, make sure you get it all off, um, and that all the soil and debris is removed. And then from there, you apply your sanitizer and then let the surfaces dry. And then, of course, use the sanitizer according to the label. So you really want to make sure that you're doing this um, when you are um, when you're going to be processing maple syrup or any time that the syrup is going to be coming in contact with surfaces. You want to make sure that everything has been cleaned and sanitized first. So this is going to be your first step at, at preventing contamination is to go through it and do all this. Okay, so the next step is going to be killing microorganisms. So, you know, with a syrup, you're heating it up for a really long period of time, right? And it, it's getting really hot up to, you know, around 219 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's really great. And the reason why is because this is going to kill most of your pathogens. So this is going to kill your E. coli and your Listeria and your Salmonella. And it may actually kill some of the molds as well. Um, so, you know, that can really help with, with making sure those molds um, get killed. The one thing it will not kill is that Clostridium botulinum. And that's because the spores of that organism are heat resistant. So that's going to be a really big concern, and I'll talk in a minute about how we're going to control Clostridium botulinum. But that that heat process is going to be really great, you know, especially if your equipment's clean and everything. It's going to be really great at killing those organisms that that might be a concern. The one thing to note, though, is after your heat processing, if you recontaminate the product in some way, then you're going to have you could potentially have pathogens in there again so again that's why you want to make sure that you have that cleaning and sanitizing going that you're keeping things clean you know wearing you know clean gloves if you're wearing gloves that your equipment's been kept clean because you're going to try to avoid recontaminating you know you try your best to avoid recontaminating that product you don't want to recontaminate the product so because the heat's taking care of you know most everything Okay, so how are we going to um, control Clostridium botulinum? Okay, so with pH is one of the major ways we control it, but we have already learned that Clostridium botulinum likes to grow um, at the same pH, you know, and even a wider range of pH that um, that with the maple syrup, right? So it'll grow at the same pH as maple syrup and even wider pH. So bricks um, does play a role in this um, in, with some regard um, because, of course, that's your soluble solids. The sugar content, as you're boiling that product, the sugar content is increasing. Um, and the sugar content affects the water activity because that sugar binds up water and makes it unavailable for microbial growth. So that is, you know, one aspect that helps a lot. The major contributor that we're looking at for controlling Clostridium botulinum is going to be the water activity, the absolute water activity. So um, with this, we're looking at having a water activity below 0 0.86. So, you know, most of the syrups will come in um, a little bit below this. I know that, you know, with um, with the water activity, as it gets lower, you're going to have issues with the syrup darkening, maybe some quality issues um, or grading issues because of that. But but from a safety standpoint, that's going to be what's controlled clostridium botulinum. So um. The other thing to note is that yeast and molds will still grow at a water activity between 0.7 and 0.86. So it's really recommended that you get the water activity down closer to about 0.65 to ensure that yeast and molds aren't going to grow either. Um, but I, you know, again, that's going to be one of those concerns where. Um, 
you know, you could potentially affect the grading of the syrup if if you put it down too far, right? So, but definitely, you know, you're aiming for below 0 0.86. You can at least control pathogens um, and, and the bacteria the bacterial pathogens are contaminating or potentially contaminating the syrup. Okay, so bottling. Um, during the bottling process, you want to make sure that you're preventing recontamination again. So, you know, definitely keeping things clean. Make sure you're, um, whatever you're going to put the syrup into that it is approved is a food grade. Um, container so you know like glass containers with um, lids when you fill the syrup into the bottle you want to make sure syrup temperatures between 180 and 190 and so this is really going to help with making sure that um, any microorganisms that might get in there during the bottling process are killed um, and then also it's going to help with sealing the container so, you know, you're creating a hermetic seal when you put the lid on it. And so that keeps um, oxygen from getting in there. And then also keep in mind that um, oxygen is poorly dissolved in products that are hot. So, so that's where you kind of get that anaerobic conditions that allow Clostridium botulinum to grow if the water activity is not low enough. So. You definitely, you know, want to make sure that that syrup, though, is not hot so you can get a proper seal on it so that it doesn't spoil and you don't get contamination in there um, during the bottling process. The other thing um, you to know is that you want to make sure that the rims are also clean, um, especially depending on what you use, because if you get syrup on the rim, it may not create a good seal. And then that can potentially be an issue for, you know, still getting a lot of different microorganisms to grow um, in that product. So you want to make sure that, you know, the, the rim is clean, that it's not all, all sticky and filled with, covered with stuff. And then after you um, put the lid on it, you invert it for at least one minute. And so that really helps. Um, it'll kill off any microorganisms that might be on the lid um, and then also really helps with sealing. So if you're using, you know, depending on what you're using to, um, it's, um, it's going to be, again, really important to make sure that that lid is clean so, or that rim is clean so that you get a hermetic seal on it because you want to make sure that your syrup is isolated from the environment once it's been bottled. Okay, I'm going to very briefly um, move on to talking about food safety regulations. Um, this gets into a really, really big area that I can't possibly cover today in one topic, but I did want to, you know, talk about a few things um, that are at least important to be aware of, especially if you're just getting started. And um, so it, at least you know what you should probably be looking at if you're getting started. So the first one I'm going to mention, this is a big one, is um, preventive controls for human food. So preventive controls for human food is one of seven rules that falls under the Food Safety Modernization Act. This was signed into law in 2011. And basically, you know, with this, you're supposed to identify hazards and then put controls into place to minimize um, or eliminate those hazards in food products. Under preventive controls for human food, um, you're considered qualified exempt. So you're exempted from the regulation. Um, if you're a very small business, that's less than 1 million in total annual sales, um, including the value of which also includes the value of the food that might be held that isn't sold yet. So if you're storing the food or if you have food sales less than 500,000 and you're selling them to somebody, you know, within a 275 mile radius, that's going to be the actual user of that product. So, so for example, that might be like a direct to consumer market. Um, but you do have to um, provide documentation 
um, of your sales and comply with current good manufacturing practices. And so this is just a brief list of current good manufacturing practices and let's just summarize. I mean, there's a lot involved here, including, you know, training personnel, sanitary operations, which I touched upon, and, you know, a lot of other things. The one thing you have to do, though, is if you're processing um, food, manufacturing, processing, packing, or holding food, you do have to register your facility with FDA. So be aware of that. Um, and there's some uh, businesses that are exempted from this, but most people that are processing are gonna have to register their facility for selling the food. Under Washington State, um, if you're processing and, and selling food, then you're gonna have to have um, a food processor's license that you get through the USDA. And there's gonna be a lot of regulations that you're gonna to need to comply with. So this is a list um, from, that's available on WSDA's website. And then with the Washington Department of Health, um, they regulate food establishments. Um, so like retail, under the food code, if you are, if you are gonna be using hermetically sealed food, that food has to come from a food processing plant that is licensed and regulated. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and other regulations may apply as well, but this is one of those areas where sometimes, you know, somebody owns a restaurant and then they're processing, they decide to start processing food. And that may, even though they're retail, because they're food processing, it might still fall under WSDA regulations and require a food processing permit. Okay, so um, I'm gonna wrap it up here. I, I know this is um, a lot of information, but basically, you know, you can Google WSU food processing, and it'll get you these websites um, for product evaluation. So we can evaluate your syrup product if you need to have it evaluated, especially for water activity. Um, so we have, the ability to do that for you. We have a list of training programs that can go into regulations in depth and also help you with getting started in the food business. Um, and then there's um, a link for WSU to, that um, does micro, microbiological testing, um, routine, routine testing, sorry, on different food products and can also do testing on maple syrup processing or products and then, um, of course, WSDA's food processing um, website. And um, if you need more information or you need more help, please feel free to reach out to us. So Dr. Gangel is our food processing specialist and has a wealth of knowledge and teaches a lot of the classes that you can find on the um, product evaluation website. And then I'm happy to help as well. So thank you all for having me today. I appreciate it. I'm glad I could at least still present. So thank you. I have a couple minutes. Stephanie, thank you so much. We do have a couple minutes for questions. Is there any in the audience? Can, is there somebody that can um, uh, either share now or share with us later Oregon-based regulations that are similar? I'm glad you asked that because I failed to do this at the beginning. Stephanie, they're asking about resources in Oregon. So we actually have a consumer food specialist faculty from OSU here today. Is Joy in the room? Where? Oh, hi, Joy. So that's Joy. She's basically a counterpart to Stephanie over at OSU, and she would be full of resources, I imagine, for this kind of stuff. Yeah. Ongoing questions. Definitely. Joy is a great resource, so definitely reach out to her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are all syrups sold in Washington stores held to these same standards? Were you able to hear that? I, I, I couldn't repeat. hear it very well. Could you repeat it, please? Are all syrups sold in Washington State held to the same standards? Yeah, I mean, they're supposed to be, right? So, um, I mean, they're going to be covered. I mean, they're going to need a food processor's license. They're, they would have the WF, 
FDA regulations are gonna have, um, and they they have the oh, the biggest oversight, right? So um, those are gonna be the first regulations that are gonna have to be complied with. Um, with regard to other syrups sold in um, Washington state, um, you know, WSDA is the regulatory authority in Washington state. And so they may re have different requirements <laughs> or they may have different issues. Um, so there's gonna be the overarching, you know, regulations under the Food Safety Modernization Act, um, which most people probably getting started in syrup processing are gonna be exempted from. But WSDA, since they're the ones issuing the food processing um, licenses in the state, then they're going to um, be looking at, you know, their requirements for facilities and, you know, processing standards. And so you can get some variation in that. Can you get any variation by county and public health departments that you're working with at the county level? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, you know, in Washington State, um, the health department has its local control, right? So sometimes there can be variations from county to county if it's going to fall under the health department. So say that you're not, um, you're not like bottling, you're not really processing, you're, you're making it to use in your restaurant. It's not going, you know, into a hermetically sealed container, for example. Um, then that might fall more under uh, Department of Health regulations, and then under, you know, under that you can get variation as as well. So, okay, done. I think we're gonna have to wrap it up there. At what point in processing uh, do you have to have that food uh, certification? So I, we come from buckets or containers out in the woods. Some people do uh, pre-boil uh, is, I mean, can you get to the point where you're doing final bottling or final boiling in a food certified kitchen? Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna be selling that product to consumers, then um, I mean, that's gonna come under a food processing license, right? Especially, you know, if you're bottling that um, and selling it to consumers. And even if, if it's not going in a hermetically sealed container, I mean, that's probably gonna still fall under the food processing regulations in, in Washington state. So I, you're pretty much, if you're selling it, you're gonna have to get a food processor's license. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. Really appreciate it. And appreciate you being flexible and still being able to do this. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for having me.